Hello, good morning, and welcome to our Horasis Young Visionary session at this Horasis Asia meeting. My name is Yoncha Brakman, and I'm the founder and CEO of Impact Shakers, a global ecosystem tackling societal challenges through inclusive entrepreneurship. We started this Horasis Young Visionaries Community and Fellowship because we believe that young impact entrepreneurs working on innovative solutions will help us as a society to grow and do better. I was very happy to hear that pretty much all speakers, be it government officials or industry leaders, agreed that not only we are working to create a better world for them, but that these young leaders are the future. Horasis decided to use its platform to connect these young entrepreneurs with world readers and amplify their message and mission through the power of the network. We will host young Horasis visionary sessions at every Horasis meeting, and we have an online community and fellowship open to them. Now let's get to today's panel. I'm very happy to introduce our five impressive young entrepreneurs to you. I'll ask each of them to share a bit more about themselves and their business, and then we'll dive into some questions on the impact of COVID and how we can build back better. So, uh, Kanika, so happy you could join. <laughs> um, so let's start with uh, Vivian. Vivian, please tell us a bit more about you and your business. Hi, um, I'm Vivian from Singapore. So hello, warm welcome to all of you um, who's in the room as well. I'm very honored today. Um, thanks so much, Yoncha, for inviting me along. Um, I'm the co-founder of Women in Asia. Um, we always tell people uh, we're part of the community. We stand with the community. Um, so my team champions a lot on inclusion. Um, we focus a lot on our work on building and bridging gender and cultural diversity. Um, and that is through showcasing Asian perspectives, um, building stories that can help work towards inclusion here in Asia. So that's just a brief of what I do. Yeah. Thank you. Tiffany? Yes, thank you. My name is Tiffany. And as Vivian said, I'm very honored to be here today. I'm co-founder and CEO of Alloy Technologies. We are a fintech social enterprise. We build software for microfinance organizations. And through the software that is using digital tokens, we are able to help provide more affordable financing to micro entrepreneurs. The way it works is that um, the loans are given out in digital token loans, and then those can only be paid at accredited vendors. So an agriculture, loan can only buy agriculture goods from agriculture vendors. So the micro entrepreneurs take this loan, they buy the uh, agriculture inputs, and then the vendors go and redeem the tokens back into cash from the microfinance. In this way, we're hoping to build the trust between microfinance and micro entrepreneurs, because one of the biggest problems, which actually is the $8 trillion credit gap problem for 400 million micro entrepreneurs in the world, is that no one trusts them enough to give them capital to be able to expand their businesses. Thank you. Gap? Okay, so what do you have? Okay, I'm Gap from Bangkok, Thailand. I'm, I'm glad to be here too. Um, it's just an honor of me to be a part of this amazing event. So Young Happy, um, I'm a co-founder of Young Happy. Young Happy is a social enterprise. We try to help elderly people to um, keep them active and prevent them to be homebound and bedbound. Through our Young Happy community, we provide not only an event, but we have our platform to make elderly people to connect via digital and make them more happier and healthier. So far, we have more than like um, 30,000 downloads on our app, and we have more than 100,000 fans of early people that following up. Yep. Aki? Sorry. Um, I guess many of you are good morning, but uh, good evening in Tokyo. Uh, very excited to share this uh, panel with you know, all these incredible young visionaries. Um, I'm from the investment world, so, you know, my background is, you may not be able to tell, but I'm half Japanese, half Indian. 
So my mission, my lifetime mission is to bridge these to the two of these cultures, which there's a huge gap in understanding today. And I try to achieve those gap by bringing a lot of young generation connected to establish uh, players uh, in the investment world. So just to give you my uh, background, I, I do many things, but I want to focus today uh, as an angel investor and financial advisor to, to large Japanese corporates. So I facilitate a lot of these investment opportunities between CVCs and uh, uh, young startups in India. And at the same time, you know, I try to do a lot of cross-cultural uh, communication gap management, uh, which is quite huge between Japan and India. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to have this opportunity and discuss about uh, these topics today. And thank you. Thank you. Kanika, um, let's uh, have your introduction, but also the first question. Uh, can you share with us how COVID has impacted your business? Sure, sure. So, hi everyone, I'm Kanika. Uh, currently, I'm in Jaipur, India, and uh, but my business is back in the capital city of New Delhi. So, what we do is uh, we convert agricultural residue from the farms of Punjab and Haryana into valuable products like uh, paper and pulp, etc. So, uh, the problem here is that Every year, so in, in winters, during November and December, the farmers, uh, you know, harvest the, the rice crop that they sow. So uh, speci uh, specifically in Punjab and Haryana. And after they harvest the crop, all of the residue that's left behind on the ground. So, uh, so in absence of any suitable process or any technology, they just simply burn it. And uh, in winter here in uh, North India, it, the whole of North India, including Punjab, Haryana, and uh, then New Delhi, and then UP and subsequent states, the all of the North India is basically choked with the smog that that those fires create. So they burn around 12 millions of tons of rice straw every year. So uh, that's the problem that I'm working on. I'm founder and C CTO of Kriya Labs. Uh, we have developed a technology through which we convert that, uh, you know, rice straw into pulp and that pulp can be molded into biodegradable tablewares and uh, packaging applications. So yeah, that's what I do. And to answer your question, um, so India, uh, in India, there was a very abrupt lockdown in, uh, I think in March or April, in, in, the, in the end of the March. And uh, what happened is all the laborers, uh, they just, you know, fled from the capital city because there was nothing for them. So these are the guys who are daily wage earners. So they earn their daily, um, you know, daily bread and butter through working in, let's say, construction and manufacturing and production. So uh, since I also have a production business, so all the laborers and, uh, you know, the people, the manpower, basically, they were all stranded there in Delhi and they just flew, uh, you know, fled back to their home states in Bihar and UP. So that was one of the major challenge for us because uh, in September when we, try to start our operations back there was literally no label uh, available here in the here in delhi and uh, uh, one or two people that we could manage to find they were very expensive because obviously there is a less availability of labor so that was one of the you know challenges that my business is currently facing specifically due to covid and any idea on how you're going to remedy that? Um, and uh, when are the crops usually burned? Is there a high season? Um, and yeah, are yeah. You ready? Yeah, so the crops are being burned as we speak. So uh, in November and December, these are the, you know, the peak times in which the farmers burn the crops. And uh, But we don't have to worry about that because uh, there is literally millions of tons of it and Obviously, as a small startup, we cannot handle all of it, but we have managed to secure some vendors there who are, uh, you know, like howsoever they can, they are managing to, uh, you know, get that rice straw and store it for us so that we can use whenever we want. So they'll be storing around four to five tons of rice straw for us that will, uh, you know, pilot and test uh, and optimize our machine before throughout the next year. So, yeah. And what was the other? Yeah. How are we going to? So right now we are managing with the, you know, expensive labor. But I think as the Corona, as the vaccine, vaccine would come out and uh, other, you know, 
measures are taken by the government i we hope that the labor will return back to delhi and uh, then maybe we can you know go back to being normal hopefully thank you um tiffany you also your entrepreneurs work with agriculture do you have similar problems yes we've definitely had similar problems i'm usually based in nepal i'm right in hong kong right now so our company pilots are all in nepal and we work in two different sectors one in agriculture and one in public transportation in electric vehicles so both were completely shut down um the the one in the city with electric vehicles completely locked down um they are informal sector micro entrepreneurs so they don't have any other income stream and a lot of them also have loans already that they have to repay so um uh it's been extremely hard and actually we've had to uh quickly launch a, a crowdfunding campaign for food just to be able to get food out to them um and even that process getting the money was one thing but actually delivering the food safely uh for everyone was extremely challenging and especially in the agriculture areas a lot of, a lot of our entrepreneurs had invested they took out loans and they grew cash crops that they were going to sell and then suddenly the transportation was shut down in the whole country so they were not able to get their crops to city areas and therefore some of it just sat rotting i mean i saw stories of some farms that were literally an hour and a half away from the city and uh the crops had to rot and at the same time um the city still had to eat and the only place that food could be imported in bulk was from india so there were still trade trucking in cabbages from india while there were other plants um and crops sitting uh rotting in in just in nepal close by so um i think one of the huge problems that we faced was that microfinance has also stopped working so in the in the very hour of need when my entrepreneurs needed liquidity they were not able to access more loans and even now when the economy is recovering um oh, sorry reopening and uh the microfinances are reopening a lot of micro entrepreneurs already had loans that they couldn't repay so by policy and regulation they're not able to take out new loans so there really definitely should be policies for humanitarian situations even related to microfinances even though that's often not looked at as a humanitarian need super interesting thank you tiffany um aki since we're on the subject of financing um do you have any ideas on this yeah i think what she just made point is very very critical um so i i do a lot of um uh, financial advisory as i said in my introduction and many of the pipeline projects has been halted because these investors they want to visit site they want to see faces they want to see what's happening on the ground so uh, i i can totally relate i mean although you know uh 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 the nature of the business is very different but i think every investor is ex- you know uh, uh wanting uh visibility and in this internet time you know all your young visionaries are very used to uh uh you know probably go bro a uh, gopro casting and 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 you know uh showing videos and pictures will be a good way of providing those transparency and governance whereas these old guards uh there is a, a tendency that they really need to you know uh see things feel it and and that's going to be a big part of decision making so you know i would like to know uh we we totally share those issues i think these issues are, are across a uh, sector and uh um what will be the solution uh, for these uh financial uh issues that we are facing and i think this is i think true in many many uh, uh companies in in the uh, in the developing world uh there are many many great companies they're facing a um, shortage of capital uh and uh i think there is uh, a lot of impact that can be driven from these opportunities thank you uh vivian how has it been for you You're still on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, um the button is like really tiny. So, uh to Aki's point, um I fully agree. Uh you know, although we know that it's easy to pivot online like right now you have um organizations and companies like Run the World that can do this transition 
perfectly well for everyone. Um, but there's still this facet of in-person um, connection and communication um, that people still crave for. Um, and that's what's been happening for our um, company. Uh, typically, we will run um, tons of community facilitated sessions, closed door discussions, um, really exploring and finding out, um, you know, what are the stories or what are problems and try and ideate together. So that's been a huge problem for us um, as well, because doing it online um, is just not um, as, uh, you know, it's just not as effective. So that's been one um, way um, that has impacted us. Uh, but however, um, you know, uh, I also like to be a bit more positive um, amongst this craziness that we all face. Um, what my team also realized that um, it has also shaped the kind of content that we put out to the community. Um, we became a lot more deliberate in um, choosing the kind of top topics or content, you know, like what um, um, both, uh, you know, the, the other two speakers have shared about. Um, it's about relevance. Right, timely information about letting the voices of um, SMEs or the underserved communities to be heard, and that's what we've been doing um, for for our situation as well. So, like in the first few um, months when the pandemic was happening, the migrant community in Singapore has hit um, the worst. I think uh, you will have seen all the news articles um, about the migrant community in Singapore. So, you know, like for us then um, as community builders, um, our team, um, we, we also work with a lot of migrant um, workers. They were, some of them were our speakers before. So what we did was instead of just doing content, um, we drove a collective action towards um, helping these groups of people. Uh, you know, whether is it running, um, we did a collection drive, um, a hygiene campaign to educate them. And I think that's where we realized that this situation can create opportunities for us. So instead of like in good times where, uh, you know, in, in times where everything's good, right, you can talk about um, big ideas, uh, future looking. But I think right now where um, we are standing, it makes it a lot more crucial um, to bring out stories on inclusion, um, to, to have perspectives from the underserved community and to bring the community to be aware of situations like this. So like problems with the food wastage or um, situation with supply chains, I think, you know, as we uncover them and showcase it to the community, not just, you know, for you guys to see in Nepal or in Jaffa, but for us as a community to realize that. And then, um, you know, where we can build next is to bring in the community to like, okay, this is the collective issue that we all face. Um, what else can we do? So that is sort of the opportunity that my team has found um, that we're working towards. So um, instead of just doing conversations locally, uh, we started to do a lot of regional conversations as well. Um, very targeted conversations on um, business transformation or even if it's like about community dri uh, driven conversation. So same content, uh, but just done differently. Yeah, that's, that's what um, we've been coping with. Yeah. And you were talking about migrant workers. Mm -hmm. and are you facing the same problems where a lot of them went home now? Um, so I think it's actually slightly bit different um, because the situation here is, uh, you know, they, they, they actually don't, we don't chase them out um, from our country. So they're sort of like, they're still kept here and, and uh, we have proper housing and accommodation. So actually a lot of them, um, uh, they know that if they leave, it will be hard for them to come back again because of situation, you know, worldwide, right? You never know what, when a lockdown is going to happen. So uh, we do not have this sudden, um, you know, outflow of the migrant community. However, um, um, it is still affecting a lot of businesses here because uh, Singapore does rely on constant um, inflow of migrant community. And it's, it's the transition, right? Um, you have some migrant community wanting to go home and then like new migrant community to come in. So of course, um, to a certain extent, it's still affected, but we don't have that sudden um, outpour like some cities were facing. I think Malaysia was facing that quite a bit um, with us because it was a very clear choice. Um, do they want to stay or live Singapore? Uh, but I think for the other city migrant workers, um, there wasn't this sudden outflow. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mm. Uh, Gap, you're working on a, a different problem, um, but on a community that was heavily impacted all over the world. Um, can you share a bit how, how it has been? Okay, so... Um, maybe... I take care with the, the most, how to say, uh, elderly people 
if you know that they are the the the, the most risk right to 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 affect from the covid 19 and um not not only for the health is is gonna affect to them but in another term you know the mental health issue is a huge problem for them also uh even is uh has a pandemic but during the the the, the normal situation time the 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 mental health is the huge issue for urban elderly people, such as in Bangkok. Do you know more than 60% of elderly people who live in Bangkok, okay? They are facing the mental health issue and it's lead to health issue. So that is, that, that is the reason why that I start the community because I want to help my, my family first. My, my dad, he retired and he have nothing to do. And I, I have one of my set when I was young. I have to work hard. And then when I grow up, uh, I will take care of them. And the way that I take care of them, I told them that, okay, you have to stay at home and do nothing. From my side, I think that is the good kid, right? If you want to be a good boy, you, you have to do like that. But I never ask them what they want. And I can follow them. Uh, my, my dad is slightly go up, have facing the, the depressed so that... I, I, I have to change my new mindset for, for me and I have to find some solution to help them. So before the pandemic time, Young Happy run an event. We have an event every day that early people can mingle together, meet up. Because for the middle class and upper middle class, the government, they didn't want to support. Most of our member on our community is middle class, and upper middle class. I, I think it's not only the problem in Thailand, but all over the all over the world, right? You can meet elderly people in the daytime at the cafeteria or in the shopping mall, right? Because they have nothing to do so that they, they will went there. But during the, the pandemic time, my country was shut down, right? If you heard about Thailand, we are the fastest recover. Right now, the situation here in Thailand is, is fine. But everything is double sort, right? Another side, the, 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 the pandemic is, is, is better, it's safe already, but in terms of economy, right? Economic, it's, it's going down. We are the, the, the worst economic situation in Southeast Asia. So we, we, we facing the protest right now. But for the elderly people, we, we don't want them to, uh, live alone during the, the pandemic time, right? So that young happy, try to figure out how we can help them during the COVID time. So lucky to us that we have our own app so that we launched the new feature. This feature is called a challenge. Maybe it's, it's, it's will, um, how to say, uh, it's, it's maybe for, for our generation, if I send some order for you or some challenge to you, such as like today you have to clean up your bed or tomorrow you have to, uh, drinking just, a. Uh, uh, Add a water per day. Maybe you feel, hey, it's not right or it's crazy. Why I have to let somebody tell me what I have to do? But for the elderly people, every day when they wake up, it's the same, right? So we we start this challenge and it's very really work. We we do a challenge program. It's like twenty day challenge program. It's related to if you want to change your habit, right? You need to do something new every day. 20 days. So we, we do the challenge and the, 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 the good effect that we, we got is, is, is incredible. We can run more than 2000 people during 20 to 21 days. So that, that is effect and we can help early people more active. And we're going to launch this feature in the future and we're going to scale up. Yeah. Okay. Can I just make one thing? Uh, it's very interesting. So in Japan, uh, there is a company called Korea. Uh, it's, it's actually called Korea. And they do job matching, especially for elders who has left the workforce and they realize they want to go back into the workforce. I'm not talking about those in especially, uh, knees or in mental illness, but if, you know, uh, for sustainable, uh, modeling, I just want to say there are a lot of elders who could still teach us many lessons. And if you could really, you know, match those gaps, I think they, they could be a value which could be created and make it more sustainable. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. I just remember there's a company who does something like, it's, it's a listed company. I could introduce you if you would like. Thank you so much, Edelman. 
Perfect. Yep. <laughs> no, please all jump in if you want to say something on the, a subject. Eh? Um, Gap, which age groups are you primarily working with? And for which age groups do you think it's working best? Okay, um, I'm sorry for, for the question again. Um, so for you. which age groups? You say elderly, but what are you considering elderly? And um, for which groups in the elderly is it working best? Okay, so um, I would like to tell you about elderly a little bit more about 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 the elderly, because many people when we talking about elderly people, they will imagine someone who sit at home, right, and um, or stay in bed, right. But it's not right. Actually, elderly people we can divide them in three groups. First, we call active. Okay, active is mean anyone. Okay. For for elderly people, some country they define at sixty five, like in Japan, they define sixty five is mean elderly people. Over here in Thailand, we define at sixty. Okay, that that is in terms of the number. But in terms of physical, right? We can divide in in three group. First, we call active. Active is mean anyone uh the elderly that can um, take care of themselves. So that is called active, right? Another group is called homebound. Homebound is mean someone who have some health problem and they don't want to get out of, of home or they need somebody to be assistant. And the, the, the last one is called bed bow, right? And do you know the biggest group is active? It's more than 80% is still active. So that young happy focusing on this group and we want to extend this group, right? Before them uh, be homebound and bed bow. Imagine about the healthcare cost. You know, in Thailand, pension is very low. I, 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 I don't want to ask you how much because you cannot imagine. It's only 20 bucks a month. 20 bucks a month. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a little. You cannot survive for sure. So that we want to help them in terms of like take care of themselves. If they still keep active, it means they don't have to worry about the healthcare cost in the future. Yep. So we are focusing on sixty plus, yep. But right now we we found some like somebody just fifty five. They want to prepare themselves to 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 uh, to to get retired. Also, yep, it's a huge group. Also, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's let's try to look ahead, um, and think of what we could do differently. What what can we do differently when we recover? What what do you think will change? Um, Tiffany, do you have any? Yes, definitely. And and Gap, thank you for that. I mean, I'm thinking about my own parents. <laughs> my dad was a civil engineer, and then he changed to became an organic farmer when he retired. I I, I want his life to be honest. Um, but yeah, in terms of recovery, I think COVID has really shown us that um, inclusion is a matter of life and death, digital inclusion, I mean. Um, it's a ma digital inclusion, financial inclusion, being able to access services in a time of crisis is a matter of life or death. And so that I think when we build back together, the new normal absolutely needs to have inclusion at the center of all digital developments. Um, and I, I think through, uh, through COVID, what I've also seen is what I like to call exponential exclusion. So there's exponential growth of technology. Um, and a lot of these technologies are growing at a rate that it actually would increasingly exclude people. So there's there's half of the world still doesn't have any access to mobile internet, internet actually at all, um, and not even 2G. So now we're developing 5G, we're developing all these new technologies. So how are people going to go to school? How are people going to access doctors? How are people even going to sign up to a microfinance in the future if they can't access a phone, if the line, uh, the, the banks are increasingly going online? So I think what COVID really points to is that we have to make a concerted effort to build this bridge between those who are digitally financially excluded um, to those that don't even have an identity card to be able to build that bridge from there so that they can go on to how, um, like a highway, like a, a, a on-ramp to a highway of how technology is developing. And at my company, Alloy Technologies, that's what we're trying to do. Actually, we are um, 
a, a fintech platform uh, that's moving into blockchain, but at the same time, our interface with our users is just on SMS. Um, anybody with just a SIM card, you don't even need a phone. You can borrow a phone and insert the SIM card and you'll be able to access our financial services. And I think that's the kind of technology we really have to build for the 2 billion people who are in informal sectors. Um, and when COVID hit, they didn't have the money to go home. They didn't have the identity to prove that they can go and come back. Um, and their whole families uh, back home in the village are depending on them. So um, yeah, I, I challenge everyone. <laughs> I would also issue a challenge. Uh, I challenge everyone to think about how technology can be ha can have inclusion designed into it. It's not an afterthought. It shouldn't be that technology is developed and then it's adopted to people um, who don't have access right now. It should be the center of our design. Yeah. Thank you. What a beautiful message. Um, Aki, um, you invest. Um, are you investing in more companies that focus on this type of inclusive design and on impact entrepreneurs? Yes, uh, I personally use impact as uh, uh, one of uh, uh, measurement when we make a decision on investments. Um, this includes not only for myself, but also with my client. But impact is such a broad term, so uh, it may vary different from each one of us. Uh, so I, I do, you know, have a similar uh, I would like, I have a sympathy a lot on the financial inclusion, but how to do it, I mean, it is, is going to be the key. So I would like to throw that question back to her and to understand, you know, uh, how um, you're pitching, for example. I mean, you're probably, we have a lot of uh, our guests on this right now. How would you pitch it to an investor? Uh, I mean, impact is one thing, but how are you how are you differentiating, and how are you trying to um, say that you're very unique um, compared to other platforms? And I think that's going to be the key. And the problem is there, and we are, we are looking for solution which is going to solve those problems. But I would like to hear those visionaries how you're pitching to your investors because I think end of the day you have to make it sustainable. Otherwise, you know, you invest and then you have to keep asking for money. It is not something you want to do. So I want, I want to understand how you're trying to make this a sustainable solution. Okay, Tiffany, do you accept the challenge? <laughs> this is quite a challenging panel. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, to make good, to make impact on billions of people, it must have a sustainable model. Um, and as, as a company, our sustainable model is related to finance. Um, and for us, our goal is to become the software for microfinances. So there are, you know, three, it's estimated uh, to reach $300 billion as an industry microfinance. It's growing at 15% per year. It's a growing industry. But if you visit any microfinance, the majority of them are still using pen and paper. Um, they don't even have cell phones to put in forms. So what we need is technology to turbocharge that change. And we need a system that's simple enough to everyone to use, including the microfinances that often don't have internet access, including the users that often don't even have 2G access. And we need to make sure that they can continue to lend and to provide affordable capital. Some of them aren't so affordable right now, it's like at 30% um, interest rate per annum, but. I think using technology, that's also the sustainability is it. It's that we can lower that operations cost. It's estimated that 10% of a microfinance's operations cost, um, total cost is field operations, and that can be drastically reduced with technology. Unfortunately, we've been working in the sector for a while. We haven't met many companies like us because most people see this as an unviable sector. They see it as very disorganized, too diverse. It's not enough return but actually there's so much potential in it. And we just have to change that perspective of how much potential there is in this type of sector and how fast technology is changing so that the scale that we can serve people with is going to be drastically bigger to make those economic models work. Thank you, Tiffany. You happy, Aki? <laughs> I have plenty more questions, but I'll keep it. 
Okay, uh, let's go to you, Kanika. Um, can you tell us, do you have any ideas on how things will be different um, when we get there and how we can build it back? Yeah, so, um, so the pandemic has a, so I, my takeaway from pandemic uh, is a very personal one. So what I realized uh, in like past eight months is that the most important thing in one's life is uh, it's their own health. So uh, back when I was working in Delhi for the past three years, uh, you're working like crazy, you know, getting up at 6 a.m. and going to bed at 10. And, you know, we have we had a very scattered uh, schedule. We missed skip meals. I, I almost daily skip breakfast for the past three years. I think I can say that. So like now I feel if I go back to Delhi, I know that I'm going to catch the virus for sure. And uh, I don't know how my immunity is going to react with that. So my personal takeaway from the pandemic would be to take very, very good care of my health from now on. And uh, as for my business, uh, is, as far as my business is concerned, so I think that my business somehow aligns with the problem of air pollution. So uh, if you are in Delhi in winter every day, you... Uh, you know, each day your breath is equivalent to smoking 14 cigarettes. It's, it's, it's like almost a gas chamber out there. So I, I would say that uh, I would focus more on the scalability part of my firm that we have to scale very fast, very quickly and very efficiently because we really have to take care of this air pollution because this is something that we cannot ignore. So uh, it increases your chances of getting cancer. Uh, the, the lungs of people in Delhi are really not healthy or healthy. Uh, Chief Minister keeps keep sharing messages after messages, but it just doesn't ring a bell to ed, um, anyone. So I think after COVID, everyone, I, I feel everyone, including the farmers, including the governments, including the residents of the capital city, everyone would be a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more aware of the, uh, of the, you know, the comorbidity, comorbidities that air pollution can result in and how, you know, everyone would take this problem of air pollution a lot more seriously than they used to take it before. So, yeah, I am really hoping that governments uh, will take some really good measures, not just some, you know, show, you know, on the paper or some kind of that. So, yeah, that's what my takeaway from the pandemic has been. Thank you. Uh, Gap, for you, do you see uh, past the pandemic? Um, maybe it, it is possible that I would like to share, like in my my, my personal pers perspective about the, the pandemic time, right? Um, I think Thailand facing the, the the pandemic, right? After China, I think we are the, the the second country or the third country that 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 facing that one, and it make. Not only me, but other people like shocking about that situation. I, I, I never imagined that I have to go home before the sunset because my mom always told me that, hey, Gap, if the, the sun is not set, right, you, you cannot f figure out how to go back home, right? Because I, I, I maybe I'm, I'm the same as um, Kanita, right? That, that we love to working hard. We work like all day, all night, but the pandemic time is like, is 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 punched to my face that hey maybe working is not the only thing that that you you have to think about on your head all the time. I I was forced right from the situation around to stop me at home and it's, it 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 brings me back to the family again. I start to make a conversation to my mom and my dad, even my girlfriend. So I think. Maybe that is the, the, the good thing that I, I need to realize what I, I what is the, 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 the most essential of my life. And after I, I face seeing that that situation and after the, the pandemic recover I I manage myself better and I think my work is better also because our staff realize something also that hey maybe if we good management on yourself so maybe you can help other people better so i'm not sure everyone in this room use have some kind of experience that when when we feel relaxed and when we feel happy our imagination is 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 better and we we 
we can figure out something that is a huge problem. We never think it before, but at that time it's better. So one thing is turn back to five. What is your your essential goal in your life? And another thing is, I do believe digital is another tool to help the 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 inclusive and moreover elderly people to survive in 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 this era. We cannot left anyone behind, even elderly people or vulnerable people. Digital maybe is another tool, but digital is not everything. But we need someone to help them to get into this era. That is, yeah. Thank you, uh, Vivian. How do you see? Um, I think for me, um, the pandemic, of course, it accelerated a lot of trends that um, all of us already knew. But it's just that we didn't expect that change to come so quickly, or all of us have to adapt to this change um, so quickly. Uh, so to me, um, the future and how we can build better back um, is really through collaboration. Um, it's no longer just about you know who's the smartest or whoever that has the smartest ideas or the best ideas, but it's more about um, how can us you know in a room. Um, come up with uh, this collective thought process and come up with solutions that can en enable or help each other. So just like how, you know, in this discussion, like I feel so fascinated listening to Kanika, you know, your stories from um, your city and also Tiffany as well, right? So literally like we're seeing um, visionaries who can work on environment, uh, microfinancing, and then elderly and even mental health and, you know, putting it all together with, of course, um, Aki's financial support, like we can scale this model, right, um, and impact a lot of cities. So I think that's where um, I truly believe in that um, if we want to really um, stand a chance, uh, you know, against whatever future pandemic um, or, or even, you know, get through this uh, better, it is through collaborative action um, together. And all of us as business leaders need to start thinking of um, beyond just scaling our own business, but also how else can I, um, you know, like work with someone in across the region, or like you know, from the further side from you, and um, work on a creative way to 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 um, you know build uh, do use that for to impact our communities. Just like you know, Kanika's um, story of the environment and the pollution, um, I can already see how uh, you know when we were running uh, hackathons and workshops with the community, it's something that we also face in Southeast Asia uh, with the Indonesian fires. Right, um, pollution is just as bad. And, you know, I would love to, like, see if um, that's a possibility for any of our entrepreneurs here to be discussing with your team, things like that. So I think, um, like, short question, short answer to your question, um, it is really collaboration. Um, that's what we realized that um, this, it's no longer a, one person has the brightest idea, but um, together, you know, we can be a lot um, stronger and create more impact. The beautiful mes message to end on, I would say. Um, thank you all so much uh, for participating in this Rasis Young Visionaries panel. The message I take with me is all about collaboration, is about working across generations. It is about self-care as well. And I was so amazed, Tiffany, when you were talking about you crowdfunding basically for your customers. I think this is a very different approach from on, to entrepreneurship than what we've been seeing and what has been the norm for the past decades. And it stems me very hopeful. And uh, thank you again so much um, to everyone listening in. Uh, I would like to say thank you for joining us. If you have any ideas, reach out to us. Um, and also, uh, we have launched the Harasses Young Visionaries Fellowship. Um, we have an online community. Do check it out on the website of Harasses and apply. Join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Yonja. Amazing moderation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yonja. Thank you so much. Lovely meeting everyone. Thank you so much, Yonja.